डॉक्टर राकेश शाह है टू कम आउट टू द डैश टू स्पीक अबाउट सीटा फिफ्टीन एंड डापा गुड इवनिंग टू यू थैंक यू फॉर बींग हेयर टूडे एंड आई थिंक वी हैड ए वंडरफुल प्रजेंटेशन ऑन ए वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट एस्पेक्ट अबाउट डायबिटीज अबाउट यू नो टाइप ऑफ डायबिटीज that we see very commonly these unclassified types of diabetes where where we need to actually look further beyond beyond what we commonly see in our in our patients uh, with type 2 diabetes we we see type 2 diabetes very commonly and 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 uh, you know there there are a large number of these patients who need to be further evaluated and and i think dr wasi manif has uh, really brought out the important aspects about about this uh, uh, the, these types of diabetes which are very common in our country and uh, so i thank him for that i'll be discussing a little about quickly i'll be going through some of the aspects about the metabolic derangements in indian patients with type 2 diabetes and 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 uh, bring out the uh, the importance of uh, the sglt2 dpp4 combination in 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 our routine clinical practice um, uh, for the information of dr wasi manif you know uh, the unlike uh, in most other countries in the world sglt2 and uh, and dpp4 become generic in our country and uh, I, i we see unique combinations we have a ceta dapa combination which will probably not you will not see for many years uh, uh, many years down the line i mean uh, considering the fact that uh, you know both of them are 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 uh, patent having patent in many countries so we have this uh, unique combination uh, so i'll just uh, speak a little about this uh, we don't have too much data on the on this a uh, combination as such but we have data about individual uh, as i mean individual molecules so i'll just quickly go through some of these aspects yeah so what i'll try to do is i'll i'll quickly look at uh, this uh, uh, different aspects of type 2 diabetes the need for combination therapy in type 2 diabetes <coughs> discuss some aspects about the metabolic derangements in uh, type 2 diabetes then discuss about the role of uh, role of these two molecules that is the sglt2 inhibitors and the dpp4 inhibitors and 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 uh, bring out finally bring out the 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 synergy of these two molecules and how they work synergistically in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, managing people with diabetes so uh, dr wasim uh, has has highlighted the importance of you know measuring Uh, measuring insulin c peptide and all these uh, uh, th- these aspects which are very important because we know if you look at the natural history of diabetes we see that you know uh, much before the onset of diabetes itself you could if you are measuring insulin resistance you would find that uh, insulin resistance is the first abnormality which uh, is present much before the onset of diabetes and and during that period there is significant hyperinsulinemia and and that ultimately uh, you know presents in very many, many different forms and uh, when once the beta cell starts failing then you start developing diabetes and that's what happens in uh, people with diabetes so there's a long phase of pre diabetes or even a long phase of uh, of insulin resistance when the person has got uh, can present with cardiovascular disease can present with dyslipidemia can present with uh, lipid abnormalities and all that so if you look at the present status of diabetes i mean uh, the present prevalence of diabetes we all know that india has a huge burden and uh, if you look at the worldwide figures the who i mean the idf atlas of uh, the 20th edition 10th edition of that which was released uh, last year shows that one out of seven uh, adults with diabetes is from india and the tight study has shown that a large percentage of people with type 2 diabetes have a suboptimal control so there is a need for you know bring the, these people who are at at significant risk of complications under under uh, i mean at their target hbnc so as to prevent this uh, this uh, problem and uh, as you can see Uh, this is a icmr indiab data uh, which shows that only 36% of the population uh, with diabetes in the country is at is achieving good glycemic control whereas uh, most of the uh, remaining remaining people are 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 above the target and the states with the highest hbonc levels are probably punjab bihar chandigarh haryana and karnataka so these are the you know the, that is the state of affairs in our country as on today and we see that most of our patients are at risk of complications and and we also know and the the fact that we have a type of diabetes which is different from the from the western population dr hanif was uh, was actually bringing out some of these aspects that we have uh, a early onset of diabetes as we know we uh, have diabetes occurring a decade earlier than the western population and then we have uh, faster progression from pre diabetes to diabetes we said that you know there is there is this this uh, stages of diabetes that is somebody remains 
pre-diabetic, then becomes diabetic, then develops complications. So what we see is that in our population, we have very rapid progression from pre-diabetes to diabetes. And we have, you know, a high level of insulin resistance, abdominal obesity being the major factor because of which there is increased uh, increased inflammatory markers, lower adiponectin levels, and uh, and we have uh, you know uh, uh, a faster deterioration of their beta cell function. All these uh, have been shown in different studies across the globe, and uh, particularly from I mean comparing different populations, have th these have shown the South Asian population with the uh, UK population, the South Asian population in in the US. Uh, these studies have clearly shown that we have these uh, uh, features which are typical of our population. Now, uh, Dr. Wasim has just shown us about the uh, about the clustering of type 2 diabetes. Apart from the fact that you know you have a difficulty in classifying people with uh, you know younger people with diabetes, whether they are type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes, whether they have other types of other secondary types of diabetes, we have always have that uh, that sort of uh, dilemma. But beyond that, even amongst the patients who are otherwise accepted to be type 2 diabetes, we know that there is a lot of heterogeneity and that was uh, studied uh, by the, in the Swedish cohort. And then um, as he was also speaking about the, uh, this uh, paper, he was, quote, he was showing us this uh, paper from uh, uh, Dr. Mohan's group where uh, they have actually retrospectively looked at all the data they have uh, uh, from their clinic and also from the uh, from some of the ICMR in dive data. So this was, uh, in, I mean, they, they looked at uh, some of these parameters and they classified, I mean, they put these patients into four clusters. So these are not actually defined clinically, but these are clusters which are uh, which are identified based on certain parameters, uh, five or six parameters, that were, eight or ten parameters that were taken. The original uh, Swedish clusters took about four or five parameters and this, uh, they looked at this and they said there's, there we have, unlike the, six or five clusters shown there, we had slightly different, uh, the Indian population had slightly different uh, uh, sort of characteristics in terms of, uh, you know, two of them being uh, similar like mild age related diabetes was, was also seen in our population. And, uh, but we saw that there was this severe insulin deficient diabetes, which was very common, combined insulin resistant and insulin deficient diabetes was common. This was something which was unique. This was not seen in the Swedish clusters. And we have the insulin resistant obese diabetes, which was also seen in the Swedish clusters. But I think some of the uh, ones which were very characteristic of the Indian population was the combined insulin resistance and insulin deficiency. That is, we have both the components are, are, are quite exaggerated in our population. That is, the insulin resistance is also quite significant. And at the same time, there is a significant insulin deficiency also. So that was something which was, uh, which was unique. Uh, uniquely found in the Indian population and I think we need further studies to look at that uh, probably prospectively we need to look at it uh, and and that will probably give us more information on that. So we have a progressive nature of type 2 diabetes, suboptimal gly glycemic control is uh, very common and the fact that uh, we know that you know uh, there are different factors contributing to the pathogenesis of diabetes and because of this uh, we can say that one single drug may not always work in, in terms of keeping uh, the patient under glycemic control and therefore we need a combination of more and more agents and, and that's the reason why we have these, uh, these different combinations available because patients with diabetes require multiple medications and if you have a, a fixed dose combination that works very well because in terms of improving the uh, compliance to therapy. So this, uh, this is a famous slide which shows the eight different defects which are present in people with uh, which can contribute towards hyperglycemia in people with diabetes this was proposed by uh, defronzo and uh, as we can see that there are eight different factors contributing to to the pathogenesis of diabetes and today we have medications i mean uh, which are which are correcting uh, all these uh, abnormalities so you have different medications which are covering i mean which are which are uh, acting at different points to to overcome these eight defects and uh, so one of the important ones is the incretin defect which which got identified uh, maybe about two decades two or three decades back we started having therapies for that and then we have now we have the SGLT2 inhibitors which look at the which uh, t typically address the increase increase in glucose reabsorption from the kidneys and then we have different therapies uh, if you look at the uh, the, the DPP4 inhibitors they they probably uh, address six out of these eight defects and you have uh, uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors addressing the 
the other one which is in terms of the increased glucose reabsorption from the kidney and uh, probably if you use a combination of these two agents what we are trying to say what is 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 said is that probably you are uh, addressing most of the defects so that way you you are uh, able to sort of get uh, a better glycemic uh, response in, with a combination of these two molecules so that's what i'm trying to sh show in the subsequent part of my presentation so uh, if you look at the uh, incretin defect this this is quite uh, uh, quite clearly shown that people with diabetes have a, a significant uh, defect in the GLP-1 production and as you look at healthy individuals versus patient, uh, people with pre-diabetes versus people with diabetes you find that there is a uh, incremental decline in the uh, GLP-1 secretion which is very important in terms of uh, maintaining the uh, the insulin secretion and um, and 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 uh, I would say that uh, you know uh, to address the uh, to address the, this defect we have the GLP-1 analogs and the DPP-4 inhibitors. DPP-4 inhibitors have become very popular molecules because of the fact that they are orally uh, used and uh, and cost effectiveness has increased with the availability of the gen I mean with the fact that some of them have gone off patent. Cetagliptin has gone off patent and Vildagliptin is also off patent. So we have. Uh, these available at a at a more economical price, and they are uh, they are used. While we have the other ones also available in our uh, country, apart from you know, we have six different gliptins available today. Now, if you look at the SGLT2 uh, inhibitors, they are particularly uh, uh, blocking the action of the uh, uh, blocking the reabsorption of glucose. Uh, through the SGLT2 channel which is present uh, primarily in the proximal tubule, 90 percent of the uh, glucose reabsorption in the primary uh, proximal convoluted tubule is happening through that and, uh, and, and, and this results in about 180 milligrams of glucose, I'm, uh, sorry 180, 180 grams of glucose being lost in the uh, urine uh, every day and uh, this leads to a net loss of glucose in urine and I mean uh, with the use of SGLT2 inhibitors, but in the absence of SGLT2 inhibitors, what happens is that uh, people re I mean, a, a normal person would reabsorb all this uh, glucose, and in in fact, it is said that you know, with people with the diabetes would have a slightly higher glucose uh, uh, filtration through the proximal convoluted tubule, but and that also gets reabsorbed, and the net glucose loss is uh, is is reduced, and that this factor could be playing an important uh, contribu contribution towards hyperglycemia and using SGLT2 inhibitor as as you can see here uh, reduces the glucose absorption and lead, leads to glucose excretion in the in the urine and that also has other benefits in terms of you know uh, causing uh, uh, rectifying the tubular glomerular feedback and uh, and providing several benefits in terms of in, in terms of the uh, uh, renal renal uh, sort of damage which is slowed down so I think uh, uh, what we are saying is that uh, just like the the we find that uh, the GLP-1 and uh, GLP-1 secretion is lower in uh, in type patients with diabetes, the DPP-4 activity is slightly higher. Similarly, the SGLT2 activity has been shown in some studies to be higher in people with uh, with uh, diabetes, and thereby they they they, they probably uh, contribute to the higher reabsorption of glucose into the uh, from the uh, uh, proximal convoluted tubule. Now, uh, if you look at the the new class of drugs, as we are speaking of, Dr. Uh, Wasim was also uh, mentioning about uh, the uh, the importance of HGLT2 inhibitors, which has which has uh, been addressed in the recent guidelines. Because we have we are now with the availability of information about from the cardiovascular outcome trials, uh, what we are uh, seeing today is that we our approach is changing from being glucose centric to 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 patient centric. Uh, looking at the at, at at the cardiovascular benefits and renal benefits of any molecule that we are looking at, and uh, that's the reason why we have uh, we have uh, sort of changed our approach. And uh, this is what the current guidelines say. The ADA ESD uh, guideline uh, speaks about this. This is what was revised in, say, I would say in 2016 or so. Uh, it was revised, and then following the availability of uh, information from the Empareg trial. And then subsequently, all the other cardiovascular outcome trials have have actually ch actually changed the uh, the out uh, the uh, the approach towards management of diabetes and uh, and uh, for uh, uh, the I mean for the information of uh, all the audience who are here, I would like to say that you know the first line remains metformin, but uh, what has happened in the last two three years is that uh, people are also speaking about I mean the European Society of Cardiology and uh, followed by the uh, uh, the EASD and the ADA have 
so have also spoken about having the SGLT2 inhibitors or the GLP-1 analogs as, as first-line therapy in, in those where there is a compelling indication just like I mean uh, people who have got uh, diabetes with a cardiovascular disease established ASCVD or those who have got uh, a high um, uh, risk for heart failure and those who have got uh, CKD in all these populations there is a benefit of using SGLT2 inhibitors and uh, uh, and or GLP-1 analogs and so they, they can be considered in some patients even before metformin that is what the current uh, understanding is. But otherwise in most of other patients we would use uh, metformin as the first line agent. Then once metformin is, is, is uh, once we are not able to have adequate glycemic uh, uh, control with metformin then you would look at uh, uh, as a second line agent you would uh, uh, triage patients based on the presence of ASCVD or uh, renal uh, cardiovascular disease or uh, CKD. Uh, if they have this, then again you look at these uh, these two classes of drugs. But in the absence of this, you would look at uh, you look uh, look, at, look at other factors like whether uh, hypoglycemia is a major issue or whether weight weight is a major issue for this patient. And and based on that, you would uh, you would uh, categorize the use of drugs. You would choose drugs which cause less of hypoglycemia like DPP-4 inhibitors cause less of hypoglycemia. SGLT2 inhibitors also do not cause hypo, I mean, uh, do not cause hypoglycemia. Uh, the ad additional advantage that the SGLT2 inhibitors have is that they can cause weight reduction to the tune of about 2 to 3 kgs in uh, patients with diabetes. And uh, the other factor was the consideration of cost and access to medications. So in uh, that has actually changed a little bit in our country in the sense with the availability of uh, the generic forms of uh, uh, DPB-4 inhibitors and even SGLT2 inhibitors, particularly dapagliflozin is available in a generic form. So that has made uh, uh, these two uh, classes of drugs uh, easily accessible while the GLP-1 analogs still remain uh, in, in the, uh, beyond the reach of many of our patients. So. Uh, if you have ASCVD or heart failure or CKD is present, then the SGLT2 inhibitors with proven cardiovascular benefits like uh, the uh, empagliflozin or dapagliflozin and even CANA are, are the preferred agents. GLP-1 receptors, uh, ag receptor agonists with proven CVD benefits that is uh, liraglutide, semaglutide are the ones that are uh, and, uh, and even um, dulaglutide are the ones which are, which are preferred. So, uh, the choosing the second and third line agent therefore depends a lot on on uh, on the presence of these factors that is uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease heart failure or ckd and in the absence of these we are looking at factors like uh, hypoglycemia weight and 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 uh, the availability of and accessibility to these drugs now just a quick uh, mention about the cardiovascular outcome trials with uh, with the DPP-4 inhibitors, as we can see, they, we had uh, cardiovascular outcome trials with most of the DPP-4 inhibitors, and we have what we have uh, understood from this is that these molecules are are safe from the cardiovascular point of view, but they do not have any additional benefit in terms of reducing the cardiovascular events. But they are safe in terms of uh, in terms of uh, people who have cardiovascular disease, who have existing cardiovascular disease, or have multiple risk factors for cardiovascular disease. In such patients, they can be used without safely without any problem and uh, across the board all the trials if you look at uh, this uh, has all the trials uh, for, for glucose lowering agents and we, what we see is that when you look at uh, some of the trials like the Empareg trial that was the, f uh, the one which showed a significant cardiovascular benefit and a benefit in terms of uh, a reduction in three point mace and also a reduction in the cardiovascular I mean all, all cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality and then we have uh, uh, other uh, uh, data from other trials like the SUSTAIN-6 and LEADER trial which are the GLP-1 analogs liraglutide and semaglutide they have also shown the benefit in terms of the three-point maze and, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, clearly we have changed our understanding about the use of these agents with the availability with the with the with the results from these cardiovascular outcome trials. So uh, I will not go into further details of this but what I would like to highlight is that uh, you know uh, with the use of SGLT2 inhibitors as we can see that uh, uh, with glucose loss in the urine there is uh, benefit in terms of the weight there is some benefit in terms of reduction in, in the blood pressure some amount of uh, uh, benefit in terms of uh, reduction hyperuricemia and uh, 
all these benefits translate into significant um, uh, cardiovascular benefits as was seen from the cardiovascular outcome trials of these agents. Now, uh, quickly I will now move on to discuss a little about uh, the benefits of using these two molecules that is the SGLT2 inhibitors and DPP4 inhibitors, how they fare in terms of, uh, you know, a combination of these two agents in terms of uh, the benefits it provides. So, uh, what we have clearly seen from the, from the uh, outcome trials of, of, uh, of the SGLT2 inhibitors is that there was a clear benefit in terms of uh, the cardiovascular benefits and also the renal benefits which is shown in the CREDENCE trial and the DAPA CKD trial and uh, uh, showing that there is a benefit in terms of <coughs> improvement in these parameters. <coughs> so, uh, having looked at that, I am not going to too many details of this but I would like to uh, say that uh, in summary I would say that uh, uh, with the main uh, if you look at the main outcomes of the trials with DAPA and MPA uh, in the heart failure trials you've seen that there is a reduction in the uh, hospitalization for heart failure and cardiovascular deaths by 26 percent reduction in cardiovascular deaths by 14 percent reduction in uh, hospitalization for heart failure alone that is the that's the one which has shown the maximum benefit with the SGLT2 inhibitors 31 percent reduction in renal events has been also been shown in the uh, DAPA CKD trial and the MPA uh, sorry DAPA CKD and the MPA kidney trial 38 percent reduction in the renal events so across the range of um, uh, I mean ejection fraction different ejection fractions that is those with uh, heart failure preserved ejection fraction and also those with uh, reduced ejection fraction you find that there is a significant benefit with the use of these agents and uh, even in patients who are on all other therapies that are required for these for the management of this condition in uh, over and above the benefits that are produced by by ACE inhibitors ARBs and RNEs you find that there is this benefit comes up with, uh, with the use of use of these uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors so I'll having looked at that let's let me just now just show you why we should combine these drugs what is the benefit of combining these two classes of drugs so uh, what we have seen is that when you combine these cl two classes of drugs uh, it it stands to reason and it's a rational combination because the drugs complement each other's actions the benefit number one is that they complement each other's action benefit number two is that they influence multiple targets to optimize the glycemic control benefit number three is that they preserve the beta cell function to be effective over a longer period of use and uh, the fact that they don't need a dose titration unlike the SUs when you used to use metformin or SU you needed to titrate the dose based on the glycemic response that you get but with these two classes of drugs you don't need any dose titration and you don't need any uh, sort of adjustment in the dosing so you have a, a, a fixed dose of both these molecules and that works well so if you're using it you use a single I mean a, 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 a sing, I mean a fixed dose which works uh, well for this uh, combination so uh, if you look at a network meta-analysis of uh, of the a1c lowering uh, in patients who are on a background of metformin you see that uh, you see the best benefits with uh, with uh, subcutaneous semaglutide followed by oral semaglutide that's more than 1.33 uh, more than 1% reduction in hv1c uh, insulin surprisingly is is in this analysis showing close to 0.9% but insulin prob i mean has the best benefits because you can titrate the insulin to whatever dose they require but essentially what this shows is that uh, if you look at uh, the molecules like uh, the sglt2 inhibitors they are they're showing a clo beyond 0.5 percent uh, 0.5 to 1 percent in the range of 0.5 to 1 percent they are there and you can see that uh, the dpp4 inhibitors are also in that range and uh, uh, together they they, they 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 bring down the hb1c by more than one percent so that's that's the essential message from that and uh, this is giving a summary of all the you know all those parameters that we always look at the six parameters that we looked at uh, when you're looking at different uh, agents but i'm not going to spend much time on this uh, what i would like to highlight is that uh, there is similar glycemic efficacy between dp4 inhibitors and sulfonylureas significantly lower incidence of weight gain and hypoglycemic episodes with dpp4 inhibitors as compared to sulfonylureas no specific cardiovascular benefits either with dpp4 inhibitors or the SUs. 
and the cost of DBP4 has come down significantly, at least the cost of sitagliptin and vildagliptin has come down significantly, while linagliptin still remains at a, at a higher price. But uh, what we are seeing is that uh, uh, we have this, uh, uh, the, 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 these benefits with, this, with the use of SGLT2 inhibitors and the DPP4 inhibitors. Now if you look at as, as SGLT2 inhibitors and look at their comparison the, with the SUs, again you find similar uh, efficacy, lower, much lower weight gain because you can get weight loss with SGLT2 inhibitors and there is a uh, specific CVD and renal benefits as you can see from the, uh, as we have evidence from the from the all the cardiovascular outcome trials and the cost of SGLT2 inhibitors particularly dapagliflozin has also come down significantly with the availability of these generic brands of dapagliflozin. So what we are saying is that uh, clearly there is a benefit of combining these two who, which uh, these two agents which have a modest action 0.6 to 0.8% uh, reduction in HbA1c combination brings down the HbA1c by more than 1% and as I was mentioning earlier that it covers, addresses most of the defects. So you can say that almost uh, 6 out of the 8 defects are addressed or maybe the 7 out of the 8 defects are addressed by the use of this combination and hence you are, you are able to effectively bring down the blood glucose levels and this is seen in, in, in uh, clinical, I mean clinical trial data also. Uh, we have clinical trial data of the combination with the uh, with the combination of empalina which has shown significant benefits and in fact in that combination we find that the uh, the side effects of sglt2 inhibitors in terms of uh, in terms of uh, uh, urinary infection and the genito urinary infections has been lower with the with the use of the combination which could be either because of the greater reduction in hb1c or it could be because of uh, the dpp4 inhibition in the in the microorganisms uh, so these are the postulate mechanisms suggested but there is a benefit that is the uh, that is what is seen with the use of this combination while we don't have a uh, lot of data with the uh, dapa sita there's an ongoing study which is looking at uh, the real world study looking at uh, looking at the benefits of this combination and also the uh, in terms of the glycemic benefits and also the other benefits uh, of this combination so we need to um, uh, await results of that while we know that you know there is a complementary action of uh, dpb4 inhibitors and sglt2 inhibitors which i have already you know spoken about uh, but i would just like to highlight here that what happens is that the sglt2 inhibitors lead to an increase in in the glucagon secretion which is which is suppressed by the DPP4 inhibitor. So, they complement with each other in terms of this uh, action also. So, uh, the combination therapy addresses multiple uh, pathways, uh, multiple uh, metabolic abnormalities. They, it progress, uh, probably delays the natural progression of diabetes, can be used in, in uh, patients across the spectrum of diabetes and uh, it could help enable more patients to reach glycemic goals with a lower risk of hypoglycemia, lower weight gain and also uh, providing the cardiovascular benefits. So, those are the benefits of this uh, combination of uh, SGLT2 inhibitor with DPP4, SGLT2 inhibitor with the DPP4 inhibitor. Particularly, here we are speaking about sitagliptin and and uh, and uh, uh, dapagliflozin. And uh, so, I think uh, that is quite clear and uh, 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 when you are looking at selecting therapy for patients with uh, type 2 diabetes and if you look at two important factors the 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 evidence that is available and their mechanism of action what we can see is that uh, uh, as you look at uh, you know the evidence from cvots you are uh, more in favor of using deep, uh, sglt2 inhibitors in people with acvd ckd or heart failure and uh, when you're looking at uh, the uh, proportion of patients who can be who can be on therapies like dpp4 inhibitors because of their easy availability and uh, the fact that uh, they would benefit a significant proportion of patients with diabetes, the, 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 the combination of this remains a useful combination. So uh, I would probably conclude with one or two slides, the, this one saying that you know uh, this is a rational combination which uh, addresses 6 out of 8 pathophysiological defects uh, which are contributing to the development of hyperglycemia and diabetes. And uh, there is proven safety and efficacy of both the drugs. Additional benefit in, in terms of the cardiovascular and renal protection that is provided. And uh, the fact that the pharmacokinetics are appropriate with, uh, with once daily dosing of both the molecules. And uh, the availability of CVOT data.
and however this should not be used in some patients like patients with uh, who are having lada or uh, dr wasim has rightly pointed out that you know uh, the widespread use of this com uh, with the of uh, dapagliflozin may sometimes be a, 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 a issue in particularly when you're using it in people with lada or those who have unclassified diabetes those who have those who are actually type 1 diabetes he also gave us the example of the 27 year old uh, uh, south asian who who presented with ketoacidosis because he was started on hgt2 inhibitor uh, when he was not controlled with metformin alone so that these are things which have to be kept in mind and uh, for the for the dpp4 inhibitors you have to avoid it in patients with acute pancreatitis and uh, you know uh, those who have got frequent genital and urinary tract infections you may have to avoid that so these are situations where we and those with any prior history of dk so i think these are three or four situations which we should clearly keep it in mind any patient in a severely catabolic state that is somebody who is losing weight very high sugars who is uh, admitted to the uh, to the hospital in such situations never use a sglt2 inhibitor and avoid dpp4 inhibitors in patients who have got prior history of pancreatitis or a person with uh, fibrocalcific pancreatic diabetes also in all these situations avoid the use of dpp4 inhibitors so with that i'll conclude by with this slide saying that uh, uh, we need to look beyond hb1c lowering and and look at the cardiovascular renal benefits provided by the age, i mean and and choose agents based on uh, the benefits that they provide metformin while metformin remains a first line therapy but uh, we need to look at uh, all the other class of drugs that are available and some of our patients we may we may would, uh, we may also look at using uh, drugs like the sglt2 inhibitors and glp1 analogs even ahead of metformin particularly when there is intolerance to metformin or when they are mildly hyperglycemic and you require a single agent you may choose uh, agents like the the sglt2 inhibitors uh, in such scenario so i think uh, this combination uh, remains uh, a very useful combination in the management of diabetes and and it provides not only glycemic benefit but even provides the extra glycemic benefits that we are looking at so with that i'll conclude and thank you all for the hearing and thank you <coughs> thank you rakesh any clarification or Mike. Yeah. So, uh, if you look at the if you look at the data about uh, canagliflozin and dapagliflozin, we had some uh, studies showing that there was a increase in peripheral amputations in uh, in in uh, lower limb amputations, particularly uh, with the use of these agents. So, uh, so those with peripheral vascular disease are are a, still a group while. while larger studies have not shown the uh, shown that to be a important signal like you know when you look at the larger cardiovascular outcome trials they they did not show this uh, increase in increase in amputations but uh, but still i think uh, when there is a presence of peripheral vascular disease it would be prudent to avoid the use of uh, sglt2 inhibitors dr uh, wasim would you like to add to this no no i think you are absolutely right i think the smpc says that you should not be using especially if there is active foot ulceration these drugs need to be avoided uh can i have a question uh thank you rajesh i think that was uh, rakesh there was a very comprehensive uh, talk um, just to um, go through all this thing now one of the things which i always wanted to ask is uh there had been some publication i don't know whether from um, avdesh ak singh and the others which have shown a better efficacy and response of dpp4 inhibitors in an indian population when compared to what we get in the clinical trials any 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 opinion thoughts on that yeah so i think uh, there is this uh, all started off with you know the data on vildagliptin which was uh, 2005 we had uh, one study which looked at uh, vildagliptin in four countries uh, india south korea and and i think uh, U us and other uh, there there four i mean i think two or three different populations just studied and in that uh, particular study they found that uh, there was a slightly a better glycemic reduction in in indian population and that led to actually further uh, analysis of data from all the other studies and and uh, and it is said that uh, the, uh, and, and that has shown that there is a slightly better reduction in uh, in hbnc with the use of dpp4 inhibitors even for the glp1 analogs that that sort of difference is being has been uh, shown and uh, dr abdesh has recently published one 
one uh, sort of analysis. I think it was a meta-analysis where he looked at uh, you know different studies and tried to look at the uh, dissecting out the Indian component of that, and he showed that difference. Uh, what is uh, suggested is that uh, uh, because of the fact that we tend to have a a faster decline in the in the GLP-1 secretion in Indian population. It is uh, probably that uh, these agents which are working through the incretin pathway have a better uh, better response in Indian patients. That's what is suggested. I, I, I mean, I look forward to hearing from you also what you would... What no, no, I, I think uh, the reason I um, raised that uh, question is because one of the things that we did our um, guidelines from the South Asian Health Foundation UK basically trying to see what is the, should be the first line agent. Now, although we, again, have been using metformin for a very long time, um, I think with metformin, I think from the uh, diabetes prevention program and the other studies, especially in a vegetarian population, we are seeing a lot of vitamin B12 deficiency, which again is not picked up. They present with either peripheral neuropathy or anemia. So one of the questions that has being asked is, is metformin the first line agent in this population? And secondly, because especially in a younger cohort, less than 40 years, when you're trying to treat them aggressively, the question is whether we should be moving an SGLT2 inhibitor or even a combination of DPP4 SGLT2 inhibitor as a first line oral agent, uh, followed by GLP1 analogs or, or whatever, or GLP1 if it's ob obese. So these are the sum of the questions that we perhaps need to ask uh, and whether we whether there's still a role for sulfonylureas because from what you have shown is still sulfonylurea is a first line agent um, so I think these are the kind of things when we do the guidelines instead of just following the ADASD guidelines whether we need a more specific guideline from a South Asian cons uh, cohort uh, saying that we should perhaps uh, start thinking whether metformin is not the not the be all and end all, and we need to start looking at other agents. Yeah, as you're, uh, I mean, uh, as you're mentioning this, what I what I'm thinking is that we also need actually an analysis of the effect of metformin across different populations. Yeah, absolutely. Whether, whether we have the same benefit absolutely. as we see with metformin in other populations. Yeah. So that is something which needs to be studied. While we have been, you know, studying the uh, the, the the benefits of SGLT2 and DPP4, we yeah. need to actually look at analyze the uh, the benefit of metformin in our population as compared to other population. And that would actually help us in understanding whether metformin should always be the first line or not, or whether we should look at other agents. Because when we were, you know, uh, thinking of uh, sure. you know, when we are bringing out the RSSDA guideline, and we were looking at adapting it from the IDF guideline, uh, you know, we were we were discuss there was a lot of discussion on on uh, metformin whether only metformin should be the first line or whether we should also recommend uh, sulfonylureas in particularly in the lean and uh, yeah, lean yeah. and thin people with uh, diabetes so that was a lot of discussion there but i think uh, what we need to analyze is look at the benefits of i mean look at the glycemic effect of metformin across different studies in uh, with different populations uh, i don't know that dr basan kumar is not here but one of the things that we could suggest is because the SAP guidelines which we, uh, we, we, we published in Diabetic Medicine from UK, I think that also requires an update. So I was speaking to Kamlesh and the others to do it. But I think it will be good to get a kind of a global thing, basically focusing on the South Asian context and coming up with a, with a, with a more specific guidelines for this population. Because now out of the um, whatever million uh, people with diabetes, nearly a third of them are from the Indian subcontinent. So I think we we perhaps need a kind of a cross-collaborative global uh, thing to Absolutely. come up with Absolutely. the guidelines and not just stick with the ADA ESD. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have a query. Why the Westerners prefer combination drugs? What? Yeah. yeah. I think that's a very uh, great question. And I think especially in the UK, they hate combinations. Uh, there is no reason for that. I think it is probably historic. What has happened is the people who make the BNF or run the BNF, they were against the combination, especially if they have side effects or stuff like that. So there is no scientific basis for it. They, it is completely irrational, uh, pill burden and everything. And every time a combination comes in, no except cocodamol, you know, which is the, the paracetamol and codeine, 
No other combination works in the UK. All these combinations are there, but they fall flat. Uh, uh, you know, I think it's just the mindset. No, no reason for that.